Welcome to Stand Up for Doctors. I'm your host, Kim Downey. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to welcome Pamela Hobby and John Silver. Thanks for joining us today, Pamela and John. Hello, thank you for having us. You're welcome. I'm excited for our conversation. <laughs> so I usually start by sharing how we met. Uh, so John was a presenter at the Healthcare Reinvention Collaborative last month, which was founded by Denise Weissman and Lonnie Hirsch. And at the end, we did some uh, speed networking, which I guess is kind of like speed dating, although I've never done that. <laughs> and uh, I was in a breakout room with John, and then we messaged on LinkedIn afterwards. And John helped found the organization Nurses Transforming Healthcare, which we'll learn about shortly. And Todd Otten gave Pamela a shout out the same week I met John, and I said, she sounds like someone I should know, and uh, Dr. Todd Otten said, yep, I should. <laughs> so a day or so later, we talked for two solid hours. <laughs> we did. <laughs> That's no fair. Awesome. You guys know each other. <laughs> well, that, yeah, now we do. Yeah, now we do. <laughs> uh, and Pamela founded My Doctor's Meds, which we'll also hear more about. Um, so regarding a preview of our discussion today, uh, we all need some hope, right? Hope for healthcare. We all need that. And doctors have said in posts on LinkedIn that no one is coming to save us, that they think no one cares that doctors are drowning. Well, anyone that knows me in these spaces knows that I care as much as humanly possible and then some. And obviously, I can't solve all the world's problems by myself. <laughs> and that's one reason I thought it was such a breath of fresh air to meet both of you. And I thought doctors would love to hear from you, too. And John, as a nurse, is working with an entire organization to transform healthcare. And Pamela, as a patient, is also working passionately to support doctors. Um, uh, upon connecting the two of you, Pamela said she loves where John's bio says, determined to become the solution. And she shared that absolutely resonates with her and it's something all three of us have in common. Uh, so we'll start by, I'll ask you each, uh, what would you most like our audience to know about you as we begin our conversation? And uh, John, why don't you go first? Well, I'm old. Uh, this is my actually my <laughs> 50th year in healthcare. Um, I, I just got consumed with the question of what's wrong with healthcare and how do we fix this mess. Um, so, even though I'd been a, I'd been in healthcare for a long time, uh, I went back and went outside of healthcare into a multidisciplinary PhD um, to look back at healthcare to see if maybe something I could see as a philosopher because I just didn't see any answers coming from any of the other fields. And I think what that led me to was the discovery of what I call the missing link, which is the system design that will basically empower all of us, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, all of us to come together, work as partners and figure out, you know, how can we help this country move toward health? Yeah, well, thank you. That's a great summary. And um, Pamela, what would you like to know us to know about you? Um, I'm just a former patient, and I lived in the on and off in the hospital for about three years. So I have sort of an understanding of just the burdens that providers bear. And I came across a residency student that um, I saw hopelessness in his eyes that scared me when he was about to embark on a life of care for others that I really just thought, how can I help? How can I be someone that could positively change and bring hope back to this resident's eyes? Um, and so we started forming my doctor's meds, but I, I really just want to remind everyone, I'm just a former patient, but I'm dedicated to reminding patients to go back and thank their providers and, and that and that physicians and clinicians need to know that your legacy lives on far after we leave your care. Absolutely, yes, that's so true. And uh, so John, do you wanna tell us how um, uh, your uh, organization, Nurses Transforming Healthcare actually got started because you've paired up with a couple other people, right? Uh, correct. 
<clears throat> I uh, actually started coming out with this model back in the uh, around 2010 or 11 <clears throat> after I'd done a lot of traveling overseas to look at different types of health systems. And um, it just kind of fell flat. Nobody seemed very interested. Uh, and when the COVID hit, uh, I started doing some podcasts again. And uh, one of them was with Leanne Myers on her show. And she connected me with Kim Evans, who's an integrative nurse practitioner out of Louisville, Kentucky, who'd also written a book on, tra you know, transforming healthcare. And I also connected with Kim Bartholomew, who was a health culture expert. And both of them basically came to me and said, you know, we've been working at this process level stuff, trying to fix healthcare. And suddenly, you know, when we heard you talk, we realized that's not the problem. The problem is the system. And we have the wrong system design in place, and it creates this moral injury for the providers and, and patients um, that are in this system. Uh, it neglects almost 40% of our country, uh, and our health outcomes are deteriorating. So we formed Nurses Transforming Healthcare and then have met basically every Saturday for almost three years mm. um, uh, to create membership and to start driving this message into the public domain. Hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, starting this up. That's very exciting and it's very important and uh, very necessary. Um, Pamela, would you like to share how you started uh, My Doctor's Meds? Sure. And I, John, I love what you're doing, by the way. I know we'll get a moment to say that everything that I've learned about you is just incredible. But um, when I found out we lose a doctor day to suicide, I couldn't believe that the very people that care for us when we're sick and dying aren't being cared for. And um, I was devastated with a lot of the research that I was finding um, burnout and, and, and it goes beyond burnout now post pandemic, but um, the, some of these issues were present before pandemic. So when I, when the research started becoming so heartbreaking, um, uh, my husband and I kind of stood back and I said, I don't know what I saw in this pediatric resident's eyes. I don't know what it was. But as I told him that I was uh, medicine saved my life and what he does saves people just like me and that I'm now a vibrant adult because of what he does, I think I gave him a, a big sense of why he he got into medicine in the first place. And I sort of reminded him um, that what he does matters. Um, so we decided what we're good at is uh, storytelling and maybe some of the antidote to the science could be a little bit of creativity and it could be an opportunity um, for us to, to really invigorate patients to go back and to thank their, all the people that, that um, had a hand in their care. Because I don't think they get a lot of thank yous. I don't know if they get a lot of people come, you say, they say, come back and visit. But um, I was telling John, I, I sent him a little essay that I got to write, write for UVA and their mattering chapter. And they said, please write about your favorite nurse. And I was so excited to, these, these memories of nurse Shirley started flooding back to me because we have to remind them that they matter. And the research coming out, the Virginia and Commonwealth University just found that mattering was the best predictor of intention to stay in the health system. Mm -hmm. So my doctor's meds is almost that embodiment of reminding physicians and clinicians that they matter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you would, people would think that they just know that, right? They're doctors or they're <laughs> nurses. Um, but I've had doctors share on um, either in posts or just in conversation that they go to work every day, not knowing that they're making a difference. And some of it is, again, because everything that's imposed upon them, and again, getting into the moral injury, sometimes they can't do what they you know, want to do or feel like they need to do for their patients. And that all contributes. So it's very important to raise awareness and, and let people know, right, and to let their uh, health care clinicians know that they do matter and that they are making a difference. So yeah, thank you um, both for uh, you know spotlighting that. 
Um, John, would you like to talk at all about your travels overseas? Because one thing that I find interesting is I've spoken with doctors from Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Canada, and these issues are ubiquitous. And uh, I was wondering how much is related to the EMR or not, like that that came out globally because these aren't problems that are just in America. No, you're absolutely correct. And I also found out the geography of country has a has a huge impact too. So if you, you know, when I went I went to Germany and studied the uh, uh, Bismarck model type healthcare they have there. And, but we have to remember that, you know, Germany's smaller than Montana. And mm -hmm. And so you got, you know, a very condensed population in something the size that's smaller than one of our states. Uh, we actually share more in common with Australia and Canada in that we have huge geographies with very disparate, uh, frequently rural populations. Um, that nobody's kind of figured out how to get, how do we get care there? And then what kind of care do we need? Um, so I, I'd gone originally to Argentina because I wanted to look at some of the South American systems. Uh, and Argentina had, you know, some prowess in medicine for several decades. Uh, and then I went to Germany. Uh, I went to England twice, uh, including presenting at the first STTI conference where I met nurses from all over Europe. So that was great. Uh, and then I gave a talk at UCLA where I met a lot of the Pacific Rim people that were not necessarily physicians or nurses, but they were all engaged in some way with health systems in their country. And they were pretty educated people, so they, you know, they had a lot of opinions on that. Um, and, and those travels, I think, opened up that there are a lot of little pieces that work in a lot of different countries for a specific task. Um, and when I look back at the public utility model, I could see that, oh, yeah, they're using this part of this model in this country. I'll give you an example. Atul Gawande wrote an article about healthcare in Costa Rica and the dramatic kind of results they had in population health. And the only thing they did was tie in public health with doctors. But, you know, they don't have that nurse practitioner army to uh, that can unleash innovation in the delivery of health services uh, that we have in this country. Uh, and Canada and Australia are slowly getting there, but they don't have that yet either. Uh, so it was just very revealing to me to go talk to people and doctors and nurses in foreign countries to find out, you know, how they perceive their systems. And they're all having troubles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of them are moving more toward the U.S. model. Uh, some of them are, are not. Um, but they all have frustrations and problems. Right. Do you think some of it is just the culture of medicine through the ages? Well, I think you have to be careful with that culture of medicine through the ages stuff. Um, you know, until you know, 1800s, uh, doctors didn't even do surgery. Uh, in fact, if you look, it's actually prohibited in their Hippocratic Oath. Uh, medicine is a dominant field in healthcare. Uh, it was pretty concentrated in urban areas where wealthy people lived. Uh, they didn't go out too much to rural stuff. Um, and once they consolidated under the Medical Practice Acts in the 20s and 30s, um, they kind of cut everybody off, including, unfortunately, nursing, um, that had been making some really big strides in uh, urban and rural areas. Hmm. Yeah, wow. So yeah, nobody seems to have it right. Is there, do you, have you found, is there an area in the world or the country that seems to be doing it right? <laughs> well, again, it depends on their kind of geography and what the population is willing to, to take. Um, if you live in a very kind of uh, unipurpose society, like for example, Japan or Singapore or even Germany to some degree, where, you know, the people back the system, they, they think they kind of understand it. It's at least reasonably affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, there tends to be higher um, compliance, if you want to use that, with, with the medical system. Uh, but in a lot of countries of the world, uh, you know, doctors are far and few between. Mm -hmm. And people tend to fall back on homeopathic and, you know, kind of 
herbs and spices and stuff like that for their for their health care. But then you look at maternal death rates and you look at uh, pediatric death rates and you look at, you know, age and lifespans and stuff. Um, it's, it's really doing the best they can with the resources they have, um, but it's not meeting, you know, national health goals. Sure, right. And there's like screenings would be almost unheard of in certain areas. <laughs> you, know, you just show up if you're uh, doing quite poorly. <laughs> I mean, I've had interest in people. I've talked to people in India, South Africa, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, South Korea. Uh, so we've gotten a, a pretty good global outreach on uh, of interest in this uh, this model. Okay, terrific. Um, so Pamela, why don't you tell us a little more about my doctor's meds, about actually starting it, and what you're actually doing, things like that. Sure. Um, we realized that we needed to have more conversations with the clinicians in our lives. And I love that John's on today because most of the preliminary conversations we had were with an RN that we trusted and, and was a friend of ours that said, do we have, do you have wellness programs like this? What exists as far as support at your hospital? Can you give us an idea of maybe where we could be of more support or what exists and he gave us some great ideas preliminarily of coming into grand rounds and it be a moment where there's not any science and just a moment of reflection of what they do for their patients and, and some success stories for them um, outside of learning about something, just not have a hat on for a moment and kind of absorb a thank you to give them a boost. And he really reminded me that to not forget about nurses through this entire endeavor. And I, I mean, I'm telling you, it gives me chills thinking about it because he said, I know you're going to call it my doctor's meds. And the reason we wanted to do that was uh, growing up, my mom would say, man, that's a good doctor. What a great doctor you have. What a great team they are. Wow. You know, and she would always amplify the fact that it wasn't just the doctor and that they, we loved my doctor's meds because we needed to be giving them this uh, this positivity back for the burdens that they bear. Um, and so he said, I know you're gonna call it my doctor's meds. Do not forget about the nurses. Do not forget those bedside friends. And so um, I, I realized as we were going to some of our appointments, I started reaching out to the nurses just within my purview. Um, and I said, do you have anything in your break room? Do you have anything where we can come in and just give your staff a boost? And if they said no, we would, you know, we were basically just word of mouthing it. Um, we finally um, got some traction when I reached out to Corey Feist with the Dr. Lorna Breen Foundation, and I said to him, listen, if I can be of service to you, let me know. I want to be able to be a program that we can, you know, be plugged into institutions. And, and he gave me a, an amazing group of people that started championing our work. And then um, when I became an ambassador for the Dr. Lorna Breen Foundation, it it really amplified our voice. So it's going to take, again, it's like we talk about, it, it's going to take all of us, but I really want to make sure that um, we stay dedicated to anything for meaningful support. Uh, what, what you do, John, and what you have, what you're doing now is with this army of nurses. I love that you say army of nurses. Um, not only do we appreciate your lifetime in healthcare, that was so cool to see in your bio, 24 plus years in healthcare and now to be dedicated to doing even more that you're not gonna watch people kick the can down the road, um, that we have to change things um, and together we'll get there. So, so yeah. yeah well, th well, thank know, one, thing that, one thing I think needs to be cleared up is what we mean when we say healthcare. What are mm -hmm. we really talking about? Because if you look at the spectrum of health and healthcare, there's a sliver of it that's medicine. But a huge part of that is actually meeting nursing needs for populations. And it includes people at home that are family caregivers mm -hmm. and, you know, home care yes. assistants that come in and community health workers. And we're all part of that army of what I would call nursing services that are really the majority of what people actually need. Nutritional consultation, mm -hmm. education working with you know, like blue zone type things, working with nutrition and nutritionists and physical therapists. And uh, it's, it's that team approach and that team 
thought processes coming together that we're really going to need to be innovative in how we deliver health and health services to the United States. Absolutely. If there's anyone listening who doesn't understand what the blue zones are, would you like to describe that? Sure. So the blue zones go into, let's say, a city. And it's usually pretty small cities. We're not talking Chicago here. Uh, and they work with community members. They work with restaurants, uh, stores. Uh, and, and what they really focus on is nutrition, weight loss, and health. And they've had some pretty dramatic results. Uh, as always, it kind of takes the buy-in of the community. Um, but uh, again, they've had some pretty amazing results. You know, you are what you eat, right? Mm -hmm. So it's literally and metaphorically meeting people where they are, right? Going exactly. to where they are. Mm -hmm. Which our system does not do. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's that's really key. Um, uh, Pamela, so you've been talking a lot about stories and sharing our stories. And I think, too, that's where a lot of the healing happens. So do you want to talk a little more about that? Sure. When I find uh, probably the best moments is when we leave a speech. Um, there was a pharmacist that, that came up to me and said, I forget that I have an impact. Um, so thank you. And I think we rarely hear about our impact. Um, and uh, another volunteer, it was just a volunteer worker at the hospital, said, um, Thank you for sharing your your story of survival through the years, because when I was a leukemia patient in the late 80s, there was a probably 40 percent chance of survival. And so um, she was saying, even though I'm a volunteer, she was a former nurse. And she said, I forget that I'm a part of that historical movement of medicine and medicine is hard. Mm -hmm. So she um, I think after we finish a speech and I get the opportunity to really connect with the people that are there, um, they, they appreciate just taking that moment. Um, yeah. So I think, I think those are some of the things that have really moved me unexpectedly, um, mm -hmm. by just sharing our story and it's sim simple, just a simple sharing of a success story. Not every story can be a success. And so, um, that you can highlight what they did, in certain ways really goes the distance. And I think it has a long lasting um, mm -hmm. effect as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know when I've sent a like a doctor, like a thank you note or even an update for what I'm doing, some of them say like it made their whole week. You're so good at that too. The way that you, you've inspired me to remind my, you know, send those emails, just a quick, hey, thinking about you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, that's yes. great. Um, so, uh, John, let's talk a little about, so nurses transforming healthcare. So if there's people out there that have never heard of it, um, what <laughs> actually are you guys doing now? Well, there's a lot of people who've never heard of it yet. <laughs> um, we're going to change that today. Yes. Uh, well, as you know, it's kind of always, we're 5013C, so we're impoverished. Uh, so we're, you know, our goal always has been to get into the public domain with media. Um, I don't think the political process is going to respond, uh, but the public pressure can. So um, I wrote a series of uh, five one minute commercials, which we need to get produced. A very simple strategy, very simple commercial to explain how this model would impact individuals. Uh, under different circumstances, whether their child has, you know, type diagnosed with type one diabetes or somebody falls down and break a leg or whatever that issue is. Uh, and then of course we'd need the funding to get into a couple of markets uh, to be able to run those ads. Uh, I don't know if you remember the Harry and Louise ads uh, of the nineties when Hillary Clinton was doing her reform effort. Okay. Um, and the insurance industry ran, I think, in three markets, an ad of a couple in the kitchen saying, you know, I don't want the federal government telling me what I can get done and what I can't get done and having access to my, and it really just killed her initiative uh, in 94. So I think we're going to try to follow that same strategy is get into a couple of varying key market areas and then hope the national media picks it up, uh, which they did in that case. 
Hmm. And so when you say um, like politics isn't the way to go, do you mean in a sense for what you're exactly trying to accomplish? Because you'd think some things would require legislative changes or just not the not the tr things that you're trying to address. Well, I just don't think those legislative changes are going to come spontaneously from the political process. I think they're going to have to be pressured to do it. And, you know, while we can't compete with $300 million a year going into their coffers, um, they also like to keep their jobs. Mm -hmm. So if you can reach voters and start putting pressure socially, and I've talked to red and blue groups, mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, 10% of the red group goes running out of the building with their hair on fire screaming socialism, which this is not. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest sit there and listen and go, dang, I don't want want to be paying this much money and having the co-pays and facing the bankruptcies and the deductibles and all that stuff. And what you're talking about says we get rid of insurance. And I'm going, yeah, because we don't need it. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of it is we do have to educate the public because I've said if, if just the doctors show up at the voting booth, we're in trouble, right? <laughs> so we all need it. And that's why part of it. And that's why I love it that you're both on today. It takes all of us, uh, you know, a physical therapist, a patient, an actress, a, a nurse, right? Everybody. Yes. Yeah, we all pay too much. Mm -hmm. So, Pamela, what do you think about this? <laughs> Um, I, it's, it's passionate, you know, John, I, when I hear it in your voice, the passion that you have and the, the, the pressure that you have to put on people and systems is the only way we get there. And he's exactly right. Um, I think a media strategy is a great idea. I'd love to see those commercials connect. We'll, we'll connect after. I can't wait to see that because, um, that'll be such a great way to not only quickly inform people, but like you said, gain traction with media. Um, well, I got to produce them first. So far, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we have two people waiting, so make sure you you let me know too. Yes. We'll share it on LinkedIn. <laughs> we have audience audience is waiting. Find, find me somebody willing to donate their time for production. Yeah. Hey. Like I said, they're very simple. Absolutely, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so Pamela, is there other things you would like us to know about, you know, my doctor's meds, what you're doing now, what you're planning to do in the future? If you know of an institution or a wellness program or a chief wellness officer or someone in your life, or if, if you yourself are a clinician watching this and you think we could be of service, please reach out to us. There's a contact page on our website. Um, and we, we just really want to be of service um, and we want to positively affect from the patient's view, um, the patients that want to come back and kind of close that loop on the patient clinician experience. So please reach out to us because we're excited to, to connect you. We have speakers that we can plug in. We have whatever we can do for your institution and every, everyone is different. So we like to learn about not only the institution, but the communities we just, um, finish something in a rural part of America. And that was fascinating just to get to meet all the people that give of their time and their heart and their efforts. So um, we wanna impact the communities as well. Yeah, that's basically where, where we are. We're gonna reach out and um, connect with us, please. Okay, well, that's terrific. Uh, so John, um, is there anything else you wanted to share with our audience or any suggestions you have for patients who wish to support their doctors? <laughs> uh, no, actually, I'm uh, one of the branches of what I'm doing right now is working with physicians uh, and other healthcare providers. Um, I've been, um, I was just on a podcast and the three members of the, of the podcast were a physician, a doctorate in physical therapy and myself. And I think it's we it's really critical that we start breaking down these silos mm -hmm. and have the conversations together mm -hmm. and see what we can all kind of agree on. And then let's move forward with that vision. And like I said, go public with it. Um, because if medicine and nursing and physical therapy and pharmacy, if we all came out and said, you know what, America, what we have now isn't working. It's not working for us. It's not working for you. We're going to advocate for this. This is what I think, you know, or we think we need to move forward with this. And we do this as partners 
Um, I, I think that's just going to be an overwhelming public message. Absolutely. It's all about ripples of change. So I know you were referring to Dr. Todd Otten and all three of us have been guests. I was the first guest on their podcast and uh, Pamela wow. was recently and I know that you were as well. So yeah, r r here's to Todd and uh, his, his patient Joshua Judy and ripples of change. <laughs> Medicine forward. He's doing a he's doing an amazing job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm actually on the traction team with Medicine Forward as well, so I get to uh, have convert be in conversation with Todd regularly. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, uh, Pamela, for you, is there anything else that you want to share with our audience, or any suggestions you have for patients who wish to support their doctors? If you at your next appointment, um, look that nurse in the eye, the doctor in the eye. Um, the team that checks you in, the lab techs need it too. Just a moment of gratitude can go a long way. And um, and and John, I like what you said, like something has to change. We see the Medscape article come out every year and administrative burden, the same things we, we've we have to all have conversations and I'm just honored to be a patient at the table um, to to help move policy and make this change happen. So um, I'm, and thank you, Kim Downey for connecting us uh, all of our, go ahead, go ahead, John, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say, agree. Thank you for connecting us. And it is an absolute pleasure to meet you, Pamela. Yes. I, and I love your um, articles. I've been reading, been gobbling up all that you've written, John. So I'll share some of mine as well, but um, you really are passionate about this and it's so inspiring. And I was hoping to meet um, people just like you. So we'll, I would love to connect on the production end because that's something I absolutely, absolutely do know, which is great. I can offer that. And then, um, and then if anyone wants to follow us, it's at my doctor's meds. Our website is www.mydoctorsmeds.com. And there's a contact page there. Great. That's what I was going to ask you is how our listeners can get in touch with you. So that's my doctor's meds. And I'll put that in the show notes and, uh, how about John yourself? How can our listeners uh, get in touch with you? Uh, well, you can um, join us at nursestransforminghealthcare.org. Uh, don't let the name scare you. We're interdisciplinary. Uh, or you can reach out by email. I have Zooms all the time with people that want to know more. Uh, it's Forrester, F-O-R-R-E-S-T-E-R, 2232 at gmail.com. Uh, I'm more than happy to come to association meetings and talk. Uh, keynoted two or three. I've uh, also been uh, podium presenting at uh, a lot of conferences. So I'm more than happy to do that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being my guests, uh, Pamela and John. And I'm so happy that I've connected you and now you guys can take off and uh, have your own friendship. <laughs> I've launched you, right? <laughs> another, another relationship. So uh, I just love it. <laughs> And uh, so in closing, to move the needle in healthcare, we all need to raise our voices and we all need to care about each other. We already know that doctors need to care about patients. Patients need to care about doctors too. So stand up doctors and let's stand up for doctors. <laughs>